If you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Matthew chapter 4. It's the first book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 4. Feel free to use table of contents if you need to. And as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you at other locations around Metro DC and others online. It's really good to be together around God's Word. I want to jump right in and ask a question. Is it possible to be a cultural Christian but not actually be a follower of Jesus? To do culturally Christian things like going to church or reading the Bible or praying and living according to good Christian morals or at least the Christian morals that are highlighted in a particular culture, but to not actually know Jesus. Is that possible? According to Jesus, it absolutely is. In fact, according to Jesus, it's possible not just for a few people here and there, but for a lot of people. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells a group of disciples on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There are many people. Jesus uses the word many who will be shocked one day to find that though they did Christian things in his name, he says it three different times, Christian things, and they thought their eternity was secure, they will discover that they were deceived. Many people will be shocked to stand before Jesus one day and hear him say, I never knew you. Away from me. So, what does it mean then to actually, to biblically know Jesus? That's an important question, an eternally important question. And I want to show you today how God answers it. So, we're walking through a series right now on why you need a biblical church. And today I want to show you specifically why you need biblical discipleship in a church. Why you need a biblical, not a cultural understanding of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. I want to show you what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, a Christian according to God, And then I want to show you why this is critical. And I don't use that word lightly. Why this is critical for your life and for the people around you. Why this is critical for your friends, for your spouse, for your marriage, for your kids, for your parents, your coworkers, or for anyone else you interact with, and for people you don't even know around the world. So let's hear the word of God, Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22, describe Jesus' first interaction with an invitation to his very first disciples. So how did that play out? Verse 18 tells us, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So Jesus' initial invitation to the very first disciples contained two simple words, follow 
me. But what do these words mean? Well, let's take them in reverse order. First, who's the me who's being followed here? Surely, realizing who Jesus is is essential to understanding what it means to follow him. And I count at least 20 different pictures of Jesus in just the first four chapters of Matthew leading up to this verse. They give us a stunning picture of who the me is. I want to show you this quickly. I would encourage you to write them down. Who is Jesus? Starting back in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, you feel free to turn back in your Bible there, just a couple of chapters, where Matthew writes, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There's four pictures of Jesus right there in verse 1. Number one, Jesus is the Savior. That's what his name, Jesus, means, the one who will save us from our sins. Number two, Jesus is the Messiah. He is Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. It means the promised one, the one promised throughout the Old Testament to come. Number three, Jesus is the son of David. He's the promised king from the line of David. And number four, Jesus is the son of Abraham. Matthew takes us all the way back to Genesis in the very beginning of God's people there. So that's a loaded first verse. And it's followed by a list of names that show how everyone and everything in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, which leads to picture number five. Jesus is the center of all history. Everything in all of history pointed forward to Jesus, and everything in all of history since then has pointed back to Jesus. Jesus is at the center of it all. You are not at the center of history. I am not at the center of history. Our generation is not at the center of history. The United States of America is not at the center of history. Throughout history, billions of people have come and billions of people have gone. Empires have come and empires have gone. Countries, nations, kings, queens, presidents, dictators, rulers have come and gone. At the center of it all stands one man, Jesus Christ. That's the first half of Matthew chapter 1. Then you get into the second half, his virgin birth, where we see the sixth picture of Jesus. He is fully human, and number seven, he is fully divine, born of the Spirit through a woman, unlike anyone else ever born, the incarnation, the most extraordinary miracle in all of the Bible. Jesus is God in the flesh. The Savior, Messiah, Son of David, Son of Abraham, center of history, fully human, fully God. That's just Matthew 1. Matthew chapter 2. Picture number eight, Jesus is the sovereign over the wise. As magi from the east come looking for a king and they bow at his crib. Number nine, Jesus is the shepherd of the weak. Matthew quotes from Micah chapter five to show how Jesus will rule God's people as a good shepherd. Don't you love this? The sovereign over the wise is the shepherd of the weak. Then the Old Testament imagery gets even richer. Number 10, Jesus inaugurates a new exodus. Imagery that's clear as God brings his son into Egypt and then back out of Egypt as a picture of the rescue and redemption from sin that he would bring. Number 11, Jesus ends the mournful exile. You study Matthew chapter 2 and you see how God in the coming of Jesus promises hope to the weeping women of Bethlehem who've lost their baby boys. Jesus has come to end the mournful exile of God's people. And in the middle of it all, number 12, Jesus loves his fiercest enemies. By the time you finish Matthew chapter 2, you realize Jesus has come to save people who seek to kill him. Jesus loves sinners like you and me. All of that in chapter 2. Then in Matthew chapter 3, Four more pictures of Jesus here. He's the Redeemer King. John the Baptist declares the King is coming. He's going to redeem. He's going to make new all who repent and believe in him. And number 14, Jesus is the righteous judge. John the Baptist tells us a winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will separate the grain from the chaff, and all who do not repent of sin and believe in him will be burned with unquenchable fire. Then after that, John baptizes Jesus And in a rare glimpse into heaven, we see two more pictures. Number 15, Jesus is filled with God the Spirit, the Spirit of God resting upon him. And number 16, Jesus is loved by God the Father as a voice booms from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son. 
with whom I am well pleased. All of that sets the stage for Jesus' temptations in Matthew chapter 4, where we discover Jesus, number 17, Jesus is the new Adam, meaning that where the first Adam fell to the temptation of the devil, Jesus stood. Jesus did what no one else in history has ever done or will ever do. He resisted temptation fully, did not give in one time to sin. He's the new Adam and Number 18, Jesus is the true Israel, meaning Jesus is the faithful and obedient son who passed the test of temptation in the wilderness to conquer sin and Satan, which all leads up to the verses right before what we just read, where Matthew quotes from Isaiah, and we see number 19, Jesus is the light of the world. What Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before has come true. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And then number 20, Jesus is the hope for all nations. It's Galilee of the Gentiles to whom Jesus first reveals himself. Do you see who this portrait of Jesus is? In such a way that when we get to verse 19 in Matthew chapter 4, and we see Jesus saying to four fishermen, follow me, we need to feel the weight and the wonder of the one who is speaking. This is Jesus, the Savior Messiah, the one promised to come in the kingly line of David, the father of God's people, Israel, fully human and fully divine, the one to whom wise men from the nations bow, whose birth ushers in the culmination of generations of prophecy and anticipation. He's the center of history, God in the flesh, redeemer, king, and righteous judge of the world, perfectly filled with God the Spirit, completely loved by God the Father, the only man who has conquered sin, the of the world and the hope for all nations. Do we realize who Jesus is? Because when we do, we will realize that Jesus is clearly and absolutely worthy of more than casual adherence and cultural association. We cannot reduce Jesus to a poor, puny Savior who's just begging for people in the 21st century to accept him into their hearts and associate with him on the side of their lives. Accept him as if Jesus needs to be accepted by us. Jesus does not need your acceptance. He doesn't need my acceptance. Jesus is infinitely worthy of all glory and all the universe. He doesn't need us at all. We need him. God, help us to stop patronizing Jesus. He is worthy of far more than casual adherence and cultural association. Jesus is worthy of total abandonment and supreme adoration in our lives. We're not playing a religious game here. We're talking about the Savior King of the universe, the righteous judge of all the nations, God in the flesh, saying, follow me. The thought alone is baffling, mind-boggling. Jesus, this Jesus comes to you and says, follow me. There's no potential casual response here. It's either turn and run or bow and worship. You look at Luke's parallel account of Jesus calling these disciples, and you'll see as soon as Peter realized who Jesus was, he fell on his face, then rose and followed him. Everything would be different in these men's lives because of this encounter with Jesus, everything. You go back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, right before this, Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. That word repent means to turn from the direction you were walking in and go in a completely different direction. Is to renounce one way of life for an entirely new way of life. Jesus says later in Luke 14, 33, any of you who does not renounce All that he has cannot be my disciple. You think about it, this kind of renouncing, it's all over Matthew chapter 4. Think about what it meant for these fishermen. When it says immediately they left their nets, immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Think about what they were leaving behind. They were leaving behind their comfort. They were leaving behind everything that was familiar to them, all that was natural for them, leaving comfort for uncertainty. Notice, Jesus didn't tell them where they were going. He just said who they'd be with. Did you catch that? Followers of Jesus don't always know where they're going, but they always know who they're with. 
and that is enough. They were leaving behind their comforts. They were leaving behind their careers. This was an abandonment of profession, at least temporarily for these guys. Now we're going to come back to how all of this applies to us, but just see, feel how it applied to them. Put yourself in their shoes. They're leaving behind their comfort, careers, their possessions. These guys obviously were not the economically elite in their society, but the fact that they had a boat and successful trade as fishermen shows these men had much to lose in following Jesus. And we find out later, they likely still had a boat and various other things. The reality is, though, at this moment, they followed Jesus with nothing in their hands. Their possessions, their position, this is significant. It's one of the things that set Jesus' disciples apart from other disciples who would follow rabbis in that day. Disciples would often attach themselves to a rabbi in order to promote themselves. It was like a step up the ladder toward greater religious status and position. But that was not the case with these disciples, this was a step down the ladder because the rabbi they followed would continually be rejected by the religious elite. They were leaving behind their families. James and John leave their fathers. They're not the, their father. They're, they're not the only ones who we see doing this. Luke chapter 9, Jesus tells another potential disciple, don't even go back and say goodbye to your family. They were leaving behind their friends, their safety. This is a rabbi, a teacher, who would soon say to these same men, I send you out like sheep in the middle of wolves. All men will hate you because of me. They will persecute you. They were leaving behind their safety, their sin. That's the core of what it means to repent, to turn from your sin. And all of this ultimately pointing to the fact that they were leaving behind themselves. This is the message that would become central for any prospective follower of Jesus. Luke 9, 23, if anyone is going to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. There's a definition of following Jesus, denying yourself and taking up a cross in a world where everything revolves around yourself. Protect yourself, promote yourself, preserve yourself, entertain yourself, comfort yourself, take care of yourself. Even a church culture that revolves around making Christianity as safe and comfortable for you as possible. The author of Christianity actually says, crucify yourself. So don't buy it. So many people have bought it, including some of you in this gathering today. The idea that all you need to do is make a decision, say a prayer, sign a card, become a Christian, and keep your life as you know it until you get to heaven. It's not true. You become a follower of Jesus, you lose your life as you know it. Amen. Now let me be very careful here. I'm not saying, and I cannot, would not say, based on the whole of the Bible, that every follower of Jesus must lose their career, or sell or give away all their possessions, or leave their family behind and physically die for the gospel. But the Bible is absolutely clear on this. For all who follow Jesus, comfort and certainty in this world are no longer our primary concerns. Our careers now revolve around whatever Jesus calls us to do and however he wants to use us and our careers for the good of others and to spread the good news of his kingdom. Amen. Our possessions are not our own. We no longer live for material pleasure in this world. We forsake material pleasure in this world in order to live for eternal treasure in the world to come. That means you live, we live very differently in Metro Washington, D.C. Position is no longer our priority. When it comes to family, Absolutely, based on the whole of the Bible, we're commanded to honor our parents, to love a wife or a husband, to provide for children. So you can't use passages like this to justify being a lousy son or daughter or spouse or parents or whatever. But our love for Jesus, according to Matthew chapter 10, should make our closest family member relationships or friendships look like hate in comparison. And we go wherever he says to go, knowing that because self is no longer our God, safety is no longer our priority. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing to pack your bags and move permanently to the Middle East for the spread of the gospel 
if Jesus tells you to. If not, then I would just ask the follow-up question, what makes you think you're following Jesus? Because followers of Jesus have sacrificed the right to determine the direction of their lives. Sac followers of Jesus don't call those shots anymore. He does. And to be clear, what I'm talking about, what we're seeing here, is not mature Christianity. This is basic Christianity. If anyone would come after me, this is elementary about what it means to follow Jesus. It is to die to yourself, to do whatever he tells you to do. The fact that this sounds like a big commitment shows how much we've diluted what the initial surrender of a Christian is. This is Galatians 2.20. We've been crucified with Christ. We don't even live anymore. It's not my life anymore. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith. I trust him completely with my life. Amen. This is Christianity. I think about a couple I know and love when they were moving to the Middle East for the spread of the gospel to a dangerous-to-reach people group. And the husband told me we have friends and family, some, many of them professing Christians, who've told us we are reckless. And he said, in light of three billion people who are unreached by the gospel and on a road that leads to an eternal hell, and nobody's even told them how they can go to heaven through Jesus, he said, we must go. He said, the fact that these Three billion people haven't been reached yet is evidence that we are in far greater danger of being safe than we are of being reckless. In danger of being safe. Followers of Jesus do not bow at the altar of safety and comfort in this world. As followers of Jesus, we die to sin. We die to self. We lay down our lives to follow him however, wherever he leads. To follow Jesus is to hold loosely to everything in this world. Our comforts, our careers, our possessions, our position, our families, our friends, our safety, ourselves, and to cling tightly to Jesus. Amen. And to many, this may sound admittedly extreme. But don't forget who the me is here. To leave behind, lay down Everything in your life doesn't make sense until you realize who Jesus is. And when you realize who Jesus is, then laying down, leaving behind everything is the only thing that makes sense. Amen. You remember Matthew chapter 13, verse 44? Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sees all that he has and buys that field. Yes. What a picture. He's walking through a field. He stumbles upon a treasure that's hidden. Nobody else knows it's there. And he realizes how valuable this treasure is, worth more than everything else he has put together. So what does he do? He goes. He sells all that he has. Talk about reckless. You're selling everything you have. And not just selling all he has. With joy he does. I'm giving it all away. Selling it all. And imagine going up to that guy, like, what are you thinking? What are you doing? You're selling everything you have. You're crazy. He's like, I'm going to buy that field over there. I'm like, what are you doing? You're going to buy, you're sell everything you have to buy that field. And he smiles. And he's like, I got a hunch. <laughs> he smiles. Why? Because inside he knows he's actually found something that's worth losing everything for. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is someone who is worth losing everything for. That's the whole point. Jesus is worthy of more than cultural Christianity. Yes. He's worthy of so much more. So let me give you a sentence then that summarizes biblical discipleship. What it means biblically, not culturally, to be a disciple of Jesus. Yes. Biblically, to be a disciple of Jesus is to trust and obey his leadership. That's what we've seen to this point, everything we have, which may start to make us nervous until we realize who he is. 
And we realize that, of course, to be a disciple of Jesus is to trust and obey his leadership. This makes no sense for us to say, well, we'll trust you to save us once we die, but we will not trust you to lead our lives until we die. That's absurdity labeled cultural Christianity. Biblically, to be a disciple is to trust and obey his leadership, no matter what that means. And, so keep going, to receive and enjoy his love. So do you feel the wonder in these words? Follow me. Like God in the flesh approaching four fishermen, looking them in the eyes, and personally inviting them into relationship with him. This is amazing. I mentioned earlier it was common in first century Judaism for potential disciples to seek out a rabbi to study under. The beauty of what we're seeing here is that it's not these men coming to Jesus. It's Jesus coming to them. This is Jesus doing here at the beginning of the New Testament what God has done throughout the Old Testament, God coming to Noah, God choosing Abraham, God choosing Moses, God choosing David, God choosing prophets, God choosing Israel to be his people, Deuteronomy chapter 7. And just as God chose his people by his grace in the Old Testament, Jesus is choosing these disciples by his grace in the New Testament. He tells them, John 15, you did not choose me, I chose you. Do you realize this? You and I have spent our lives running from God in all kinds of ways. And the good news of the Bible, the greatest news in all the world, is that God has come running after us. Like God, the creator of the universe, pursuing you and me. Who are we? God loves you and me so much. He's sent Jesus to die on a cross for our sin, to rise from the grave in victory over sin, so that any one of us, no matter who we are or what we've done, by trusting in Jesus, we can be forgiven of all of our sin and restored to relationship with him for all of eternity. Do you see this? We have not been made for, called to, chosen for, casual, comfortable, monotonous, cultural religion. Go to church, read the Bible, pray every once in a while, live a decent life, coast till you get to heaven. No. Where did we ever get that in the Bible? You have been made for, called by God to relationship with God. God, through Jesus, to humble your heart and receive his love in a way that transforms your entire life so you live and enjoy and experience his love in a relationship with him. This is Psalm 63. Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've beheld your power and your glory. Your love is better than life, so my lips glorify you. I meditate on you in the watches of the night. I think about you all the time. This is what we're made for. Does this describe your relationship with God? Not like, oh, I guess I should read the Bible or pray or, yeah. What? We were created for so much more. We were created for love relationship with God, with Jesus. If that doesn't describe your relationship with God, you are missing out on what it actually means to be a disciple of Jesus. It's to trust and obey his leadership as you receive and enjoy his love. And it's to give your life, making disciples of all nations. Follow me. And Jesus says, what will happen? I will make you fishers of men. That was in the first sentence. It wasn't like, once you get mature years from now, or some of you will get to this level. No, to be a follower is to be a fisher. 
from the very beginning, the initial invitation to follow Jesus, he was saying, from now on, instead of searching for fish all over the lake, you're going to spread the gospel all over the world. This is what followers of Jesus do, which is why. So think just bookends. This is the initial invitation, Matthew 4. Follow me, I will make you fishers of men. To be a follower of Jesus is to be a fisher of men. End of Matthew. Last thing he says to them, go and do what? Disciples, go and make disciples of all the nations. To be a disciple is, a, be a, is to be a disciple maker among the nations. Why do we say that every Sunday to each other? Because this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It means we go out from here and we live this week to make disciples of the nations. Not just a few of us, but all of us. Jesus has not called anyone to come and be baptized and sit in one location as a cultural Christian. Jesus has called every one of his followers to go and make disciples of all the nations. That's what a biblical Christian does. I mentioned there are three billion people in the world unreached by the gospel. We've talked about this map many times. The red area on this map representing three billion people who are on a road that leads to an eternal hell and nobody's even told them the good news of the one who makes heaven possible. How can that be? Like with all the technology and all the resources we have, how can it be there's three billion billion people in the world unreached by the gospel. And traditionally the answer is, well, some missionaries need to change that. The problem is not a few missionaries need to change that. The problem is we need to start following Jesus, like all of us. The only way that is possible is if we're not following Jesus because he's made it clear this is what you're about on this earth. It's what you raise kids to do, make disciples of the nations, not be amazing at sports and get jobs and get degrees where they can coast through until they get to heaven. Like, I'm not saying those are bad things, but that's not what Jesus has commanded us to do. He's called us to raise disciple makers among the nations. Is that what we're running around the city helping them do? Is that what our marriages are about? We say in Psalm 34, 3, glorify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. How can we together as husband and wife live for the spread of God's glory among the nations? Is that the way way we see our marriages, our parenting, our family, our resources? We've been given some of, I mean, we live in one of the wealthiest places ever to exist on planet earth. Why? We have been given wealth for the spread of Jesus' worship in the world. This changes everything when you start to live like this. Sure, God's not going to lead us all to live among the red. But surely following him means praying fervently for the spread of the gospel among the red. Giving sacrificially for the spread of the gospel among the red. And then go this week, wherever we live, and then wherever you may lead. If if it's pack my bags, move to fill in the blank, I'll go. This is what it means to be a Christian. I live to make disciples of the nations. In other words, I live to lead others to do what? To trust and obey his leadership, to receive and enjoy his love, and to give their lives making disciples of the nations. This is what biblical disciples do. Is it what you're doing? So now do you see it? You need biblical discipleship. This is critical for your life. You need to be in a church that does not woo you with casual, comfortable Christianity and then pacify you every week or whenever you may come with casual, comfortable, cultural Christianity. You need to be in a church that calls you to costly biblical Christianity, knowing that, so here's how I would put it as we close, knowing that the cost of discipleship is great. I hope we've seen that sufficiently. It costs you everything to be a follower of Jesus. Your life is not your own anymore, everything. 
But you get Jesus. Life forever in and with Jesus, the one who's better than anything and everything and everyone in this world put together. He's infinitely better. At which point you realize, okay, the cost of discipleship may be great, but the cost of non-discipleship is far, far, far greater. It's far more costly to settle for cultural Christianity. You miss out on the life and the love that God has made you to experience today. No matter what may come your way, because when hard days come in our lives, and they will, sorrow and suffering, when hard days come, Cultural Christianity will not hold you up. Christ alone will hold you up in the valley. And then, not just today, whatever days may come, it will be eternally costly for many to hear Jesus say one day, I never knew you. Away from me. And then to take it a step further, cultural Christianity is not just costly for you. Cultural Christianity will wreck a marriage. And it will give kids, the next generation, a warped view of Jesus. In addition to the rest of the world, cultural Christianity is more than content to play the church game while millions of people around Metro DC and literally billions of people around the world continue on to an eternal hell while we coast through a nice, comfortable Christian spin on the American dream. It's not what we were made for. It's not what you were made for. You were made for so much more. You were made for biblical discipleship to Jesus. You are made to see who he is and with gladness to trust and obey his leadership, receive and enjoy his love, and give your life leading others to know him here and among the nations. This is the life you were made for. So will you bow your heads with me all across this room and other locations? As you bow your heads and close your eyes, I I don't presume to know how this word has landed on your heart. But I'm going to assume that there are some, maybe many, whose eyes are being opened right now to either the fact that you have lived a culturally Christian life and have not biblically put your trust in Jesus. And I want to be super clear as you contemplate your own heart. This is not about doing certain things in order to earn Christian Christianity, eternal life with Jesus. No. No. By grace, are you saved through faith? And that's just it. It's trusting in him. But some of you, I know so many people who have grown up in church, spent years in church, and came to a point, maybe like today, where they realized, oh, I've been missing the whole point. So maybe today you need to put your trust in Jesus. For the first time biblically. Or others, maybe... Maybe you have trusted in Jesus, but you see traces of cultural Christianity. You see temptations to settle for less than what you were made for. And so regardless, whether for the first time or in a fresh way, God, we pray. We want to be biblical disciples of Jesus. Jesus, we 
see you for who you are. We praise you for who you are. You are infinitely worthy of all glory and all the universe. And we need you. We need you to save us. We need you to lead us. So we say, for the first time in a fresh way, we trust you with our life. We want to turn from all sin in ourselves. We want to die to ourselves daily. We want to follow you wherever, however you lead us, knowing believing that your ways are far better than our ways and that you satisfy better than anything, everything, everyone in this world put together. So we pray, help us, help us to trust and obey your leadership as we receive and enjoy your love and use our lives to make disciples of the nations here in Metro D.C., and far from here, however you lead us. God, help us not to settle for cultural Christianity and miss the true life of Christ in the process. In his name we pray. Amen.